In this video I will explain the instrumental variable solution to endogeneity problem. To understand the instrumental variable solution we first need to understand the endogeneity problem. I explained the problem in more detail in another video but this is just a quick recap. So endogeneity occurs when we have a regression model such as the one here shown graphically here as a path diagram. The uh, error term u presents any other causes of y that are not in included as the, explanatory, as the explanatory variables. So if any other cause of y is correlated with one of any of the included variables x, then we have an endogeneity problem. For example, if we are trying to explain company's performance, let's say ROA here, and we are trying to explain the performance with uh, whether a company investment invests in a new manufacturing plant or not, then uh, both investment and profitability probably depend on company strategy. In which case strategy is an omitted variable that is correlated with x1 and lead, that leads to endogeneity problem. More generally if we, if we look at the, uh, the problem of x and y in just a bivariate case in more detail, we have uh, the correlation with x and y is uh, this direct path here plus uh, this correlation uh, times one because uh, the path for the error is constrained to be one. So the correlation with x and y is the direct regression path plus the spurious correlation because x correlates with the omitted causes u. The problem is that we have just we just observed this one correlation so we have one unit of information from the data and we want to estimate two different parameters. This is under identified model. The decrease of freedom is minus one, which means that the model can't be meaningfully estimated. So we can't estimate two different things from one thing. To solve this problem, we can apply instrumental variables. The idea of an instrumental variable is that we get a third variable z that is correlated with x. That is a correlation that we can test empirically and that we can assume it's uncorrelated with u, any other causes. What qualifies how we find these instruments is, is the difficult problem because we cannot uh, generally test the correlation between z and u empirically. We have to argue that based on theory. I'll show you an example soon but let's take a look at principle first. So let's assume we have a valid instrument of variables so that uh, the only reason for why z and y are correlated is because z is correlated with x and then uh, z can't be correlated with y. So when we have these um, correlations, the correlation between z and y is then a uh, correlation between x and z comes from the path analysis tracing rule. So we take that correlation and then this direct path to get from, from z to y. So correlation between y and z and y is beta times correlation x and z. And from here we can solve for b using correlations x z and correlation z y which are both observable quantities and that gives us an estimate a consistent estimate of uh, beta. So that's a way to estimate beta and uh, a variable c z qualifies as an instrumental variable if it qualifies for two criteria. First it must have a relevance for x so x and z must be correlated that can be checked empirically. We just calculate the correlation and we do a statistical test for the correlation. Then uh, there's exclusion criteria which have, has to be argued based on theory. Because we don't observe u, we can't test whether uh, z and u are uncorrelated. That has to be argued based on theory. That is difficult to do. Let's take a look at examples. So um, in Mokon's paper they apply instrumental variables. To understand the instrumental variable use here we have to understand first what is the endogeneity problem that they are they are doing. So what's the what's the issue? Why instrumental variable? Their dependent variable was point acquisition so people are acquiring points in a service and they are testing whether the decisions to like the, the Facebook page of that service leads to more point acquisition. And they did an experiment so uh, they have this randomization step here so they are uh, invited some people to, uh, to like the, uh, the page that they were studying and the rest were controlled. So this is a uh, randomization and it is exogenous 
because uh, there is no reasonable way that a, a computer, a random number generated on my computer will be correlated with behavior of actual people. So it's, it's very, it's implausible to claim that this would not be exogenous. So randomization is exogenous. Then we have our endogenous selection. The reason why this selection is endogenous is that uh, when you're invited to like a Facebook page of a service, that whether you accept the invitation or not probably depends on how much you like the service, how much you use the service and, and so on. So there are probably multiple different causes that influence whether you choose to accept the, the invitation to like the service that also influence how active you are in the service acquiring points. So comparing uh, those that chose not to like against those that did like the page is a, not a valid comparison because these two groups of people are not comparable. That is, uh, we have endogenous selection here. So we have basically a, f a few options. We can uh, compare between treatment and control here. But that doesn't really give us the effect of the like because uh, these people in the treatment, some of them chose not to like the Facebook page. Also some people in the control could have liked the page anyway. So comparing the treatment and control on points acquisition doesn't really uh, allow us to do what we want to do. We can't compare between those that chose to like and those that chose not to like because uh, this is an endogenous selection. And we can't compare these that chose to like against control because the control contains people that would have chosen not to like had they been asked. So these two are not comparable either. What we can do here and what Mokron and I'll do is they apply instrumental variable technique. So the idea is that uh, the treatment, the randomization here is correlated with uh, choosing to like. So if you ask some people to like a Facebook page and you don't ask the other group, then uh, those people that you ask are more likely to, to actually like the page. And this uh, can be established empirically. So they can calculate this correlation here and uh, they can establish that the treatment is, is a relevant uh, instrumental variable for, for choosing to like. So it fills the, uh, the relevance criterion. The treatment also it fills the exclusion criterion because the treatment is randomized it is very unlikely for that this treatment actually uh, correlates with any other reason that an individual person uh, would, would have uh, used to like the page. So when we have a random number basically on our computer which assigns people to treatment or control, then uh, that is independent of any, uh, any, prop, any attribute of those people that we randomize. So it fills the, the exclusion criteria. Then they can apply these uh, equations to calculate what is the effect of one-way to Facebook like. In practice uh, we don't work with these equations because uh, we usually have multiple different variables. We have controls and we can have multiple instrumental variables as well. So we use some other technique and one of the simplest technique is called the two-stage least squares. The idea of a two-stage least squares is that when we take the instrumental variable z then instead of uh, just saying that these are correlated, we regress x and z and then we calculate things based on these regressions. So let's see how it works. So we have first, uh, this is an endogenous regression analysis. So we have y, if we regress y on, on x, we have an endogeneity problem because some causes of x are correlated with some causes of y. Then we have the instrumental variable here, the z. So we uh, say that um, x is actually a, a, a sum of z multiplied by beta 2 plus the error term from that regression analysis. So we have uh, the regression analysis for the first regression of x and z here and then we have uh, the, that makes the second regression. Then we can multiply this out. So we have this uh, beta 1, beta 2, z, that's the, uh, the effect. And uh, this is typically implemented by running uh, a two sets of regression. So this uh, beta z is, uh, beta 2z is a fitted value of a regression analysis of x on z. 
So in practice we implement this model by first regressing our x on z, then we take the fitted values of, of z and then we regress y on the fitted values of, of our x from the first regression. So we run first regression to get fitted values, then we run the second regression on the fitted values and that gives us consistent estimates of this relationship. If you have more than one independent variables, if we have five independent variables, then we regress each one of those five independent variables on the instruments separately. If we have variables that are not endogenous, then they qualify as instruments as well. We take fitted values of each of those five regression analyses and use those fitted values to explain why. And that will uh, produce consistent estimates of, of beta y under the assumption that z is relevant and does not correlate with the uh, omitted causes of y.